Castro. Uh, I'm, so uh, my university is Florida International University, and we're going to be, well, my team is going to be representing Sweden. Great, thank you. Anyone want to go next? Hi, I'm happy to go next. Oh, so sorry. <laughs> right, I'll go ahead. Here um, you go. I'm, <laughs> my name is Mackenzie. I'm from Chapel Hill. I'm sorry, I'm in the car right now, but um, I will be representing Greece and I'm studying contemporary European studies. Sorry, Vicky, didn't mean to cut you off. No, it's fine. Great to meet you. Hello, everyone. My name is Vicky, and I go to Florida International University. Hey, oh, Larry. <laughs> Sorry. Hi, everyone. I'm Sophia. I go to Florida International University. I'm uh, Lara, and I will be representing uh, Romania. Um, so hi everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Lauren. Um, I will be representing with Sofia Romania for the West Coast uh, Moto E. Um, you want to go next? Yeah, I can go. Um, my name is Lucy, and I am from UNC Chapel Hill, and. I am representing France in this Pittsburgh model year. Um, I'm Maddie, and I'm also from UNC Chapel Hill, and I will be representing Denmark. Oh, great. Hi, I'm, I'm Matthew. I'm also from UNC, and I'll be representing Bulgaria. Great. Um, I believe that was everyone. Um, so just to recap, this will be a sort of informal discussion uh, led by our visiting scholar, Dr. Ingo Peters, um, and he will be covering the EU-NATO relationship, specifically that topic for Pittsburgh MEU, uh, but he's happy to answer any other agenda topics. Um, Great. Dr. Peters, would you like to yes. introduce uh, yourself? Thank you, Kaylee. Uh, Kayla, uh, for the giving me the floor. So I'm Ingo Peters. I'm originally from Freie Universität Berlin, and I'm here as a visiting scholar, as uh, Kayla already uh, said. And uh, I've been working on uh, EU and NATO security issues for quite a while. So I picked and choose from the list and said, well, if I'm going to say something, let me do it on EU NATO relations. And uh, this is, of course, only one of the issues that you are supposed to tackle later on. Uh, so I learned that you will also. Uh, dive deeper into energy security issues and food security issues. Very interesting, very important. Um, but if I uh, start with EU-NATO relations, I have to say, you know, there's in a way underneath this topic, a hidden agenda, since it's more or less about EU-US relations, I would claim, looking back into history. And uh, so if you really go uh, a little uh, into history, you have to realize the origins of both organizations of the European Union or the European integration process and NATO. And we have to uh, realize once more that in the outset, both organizations were quite separate. They were pursuing a kind of division of labor. NATO was clearly there to uh, deal with military security or as a former secretary general of NATO said, you know, uh, to keep the Americans in, the Russians out, first of all, and the Germans down. Yeah, that was a formula, the political formula for NATO. Whereas the EU, of course, or the European integration process, starting with the, uh, um, with the com community on coal and steel in the 1950s and so forth, they were meant actually originally to uh, foster uh, Western European um, uh, so, uh, uh, social integration and economic integration in order to uh, deal with the, uh, the with the devastating consequences of the Second World War to rebuild Europe as a partner, you could say, for the for the US 
Latvia as part of the West. Having said this, you know, uh, when did this division of labor actually end? So one could now continue for hours and hours already in the 1970s. Things started to merge. However, most significantly it happened uh, that uh, the EU uh, was becoming more ambitious regarding security policy in the hard sense of the world. So entering territory that was claimed by NATO basically with a Maastricht agreement, of course, with the Maastricht Treaty, when the EU said, okay, we are now uh, planning to develop our common foreign and security policy and as part of it, the European security and defense policy. Uh, however, the uh, US was always present at the table. This is why I say talking about EU-NATO relations is talking about EU-US relations, since while the EU was, you know, going into the territories of NATO's um, um, capacities or uh, NATO's uh, um, assignments, uh, the US always kept an eye on what the European Union uh, folks uh, did. And uh, so they uh, were always present at the table while the EU was discussing without actually being sitting there, you know, but they were always in the back and were always uh, taking part uh, more or less indirectly. Without going through all the steps, of course, this would take hours now, uh, uh, describing the evolution of the European Union um, ambition of uh, strengthening its own uh, role in European Union and Western security, hard security issues, military security issues. Uh, you know, and I skip a lot of things like the Helsinki Agreement, which was so important in 99, uh, when um, the EU decided to develop, this was almost the exact wording, to develop a capacity to take autonomous decisions uh, and uh, uh, military action. But this was qualified again, probably due to some American impact directly or indirectly by saying we do this and we want this. However, we will only engage in military security affairs as long as NATO is not concerning itself with this. So there was a kind of America first, the uh, right of uh, uh, first um, a commitment on, on the side of NATO here at that time. Having said this, you know, I was now in 1999 with this uh, Samalo Helsinki kind of uh, accord, all the uh, kind of intermediate steps I, uh, I uh, skip and uh, jump almost 20 years ahead. You know, there were many steps in between, but the most important thing is, I think, uh, to, to mention the so-called autumn package of 2017, when the European Union got more and more ambitious and said, we want to establish in the framework of what the EU uh, treaties allow to do a permanent structured cooperation to really strengthen our security, military security efforts. This was not least due to the disengagement of Trump, you might say, and his alienation of Western European partners uh, when he declared, for example, at one point, at one meeting also of NATO, that NATO is basically obsolete. You know, it was not just Macron later on, but it was also Trump earlier on. And therefore, the traditional issue of, you know, uh, do we get a helping hand from, from the US or are they doing their own uh, kind of um, uh, uh, game here? And this was a point uh, which was very decisive. 2017 autumn package. Coming with this was a change in government in France and the most ambitious new president, Emmanuel Macron. And, you know, he fired, uh, fired uh, new proposals regarding European security integration one after the other more than one a year, you know, you had a hard time to follow what his ambitions were. To read through all this document is already uh, strenuous enough. But his basic argument was, let's go for strategic security, military security, strategic autonomy of the European Union, including European defense, a real European defense, and even a European army. So things that have been discussed since the 1950s, 60s, 70s, 80s, and so forth, but 
you know, a new kind of push for this coming from Paris in, in 2017 and the following years. This was uh, a time, we are now with Trump years, uh, you know, and the Macron years, you could say. And at the same time, as we could uh, read in the document that was distributed for this meeting from the European uh, Union, that NATO and the EU agreed on so-called joint declaration in 2016 and 2018. This was, or these declarations were not the first ones, but they are the, those that were mentioned in this very document, you know, but NATO and the EU have actually uh, uh, formulated joint declarations every now and then uh, in, a, in a way committing themselves, both organizations to close cooperation and uh, trying to uh, mutually enforce each other and not to compete each, with each other. Just a few weeks ago, however, so we are now in 2023, there was another of these meetings and joint declarations emerging from, from uh, Brussels, the meeting NATO-EU. However, the news that I uh, could read about it without having access to primary sources or you know, I didn't take part in the discussions, but my newspaper, a very good newspaper, I would say, uh, tells me, you know, there was another declaration, but it was basically meaningless. And here it is very important to ask, how come we had several declarations before in order to, you know, def uh, to, to define the common ground and the uh, mutual commitment to reinforce each other, and then another round of discussion and no real meaningful step forward. How come? This was basically due to the disagreement within the European Union on, on what to make out of Macron's initiative for strategic autonomy. Part of Macron's strategic autonomy, autonomy concept, sorry, uh, was in a way also his statement uh, that NATO was brain dead in 2018. Yeah? So he in a way tried to diminish the significance of NATO and said, no, no, we have uh, really to strengthen the EU security part pillar in order to get along with the challenges of uh, today's international uh, order and disorder and so forth. However, there was disagreement since Macron was arguing in favor, if you really go into the document and the discussion, into the discussions, you learn that he said, this is in a way, you know, about diminishing the role of the US in Europe. And this was something that, for example, was very strongly opposed by the German government, not least, but you know, it's after all uh, quite a, uh, an important player in this field, as much as by uh, other players, for example, most importantly, I would say by the uh, rather newer members of NATO and the EU, that is Poland and all the uh, uh, recently um, 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 joining the club states of Eastern and Central Europe. Those states have traditionally been strongly in favor of keeping the US on board and, and emphasizing the role of the US in European security affairs. So they were not willing, not just able, but not willing to join Macron's initiative for autonomy in the sense to, in a way, if not kick out, at least diminish the US role in Europe. So this is the background I wanted to give you since uh, it's you know basically amounting to something that you could call a kind of uh, um, ambiguity on sides of the Europeans as much on, as on the uh, European, on the American side, since the US has always supported the efforts of, Euro of the uh, European Union uh, states to strengthen its defense. But please don't do this at the expense of NATO. Yeah, so the, EU, uh, the US wanted to keep its major institution or role in the major institution called NATO. So it was all about for the Europeans, do we want to please the US or do we want to challenge the US? Do we want to be partners or do, do we want to be competitors? Do we try to strengthen NATO by strengthening the 
common and security and defense policy inside the European Union, or do we want to gain real autonomy, get rid of the US, to put it bluntly? And so this kind of ambiguity, what do we actually want, is uh, in, the, in the background of uh, this recent document that I mentioned, where no significant progress could be made due to disagreement, due to disunity uh, inside the European Union of uh, how to go about it in the upcoming year. So it's just, it's not really new as a situation. This, I you know, wouldn't call it a deadlock situation or a coup de sac situation, but you know it's more of the same of the internal, the disunity, the internal conflicts inside the European Union, which also hamper clear decisions on the relationship between NATO and the European Union as a military security institution. So much from my side. Thank you for your attention. And of course, I'm open for any question that you might have. Thank you, Dr. Peters. Um, does anyone have any questions or uh, comments? I would like to ask a question. Can you hear me all right? Yeah, Mackenzie? Okay. Yes. Um, so I'd like to ask about the, and forgive my pronunciation, but Zeitenwende. I know um, it's about a year out from Chancellor Schultz's pronouncement, pronouncement um, which was, I guess, pretty pivotal because it's indicating um, Germany may be in favor of um, this defense policy. Now, obviously, they haven't necessarily thrown their weight behind France before. Um, but I'm just wondering, a year out from that, what sort of changes we've seen and what implications that has for the, the NATO-EU relationship? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so I see here on the German side with the Zeitenwende, you know, a new stress from the Germans in view of the, or given the challenges coming from Russia, um, which is no longer considered a status quo power, but now clearly a revisionist power, uh, calling into question the traditional European security order as it was uh, uh, in a way signed in the OSCE uh, Charter uh, for, of Europe in 1990. And uh, this is also his point of reference all the time that he said, this is over and we have to realize that we have to take care uh, for our own security by, on the one hand, strengthening the EU's defense uh, abilities, but also, and more importantly, strengthening NATO. So this is uh, fully in line with what I said before, that Olaf Scholz is now arguing, we have to strengthen our defense capabilities, and we have, the Germans also, where uh, people have been very reluctant to spend more money on defense. You know, the so-called peace dividend was spent uh, 10 times before uh, you could uh, think about it. But uh, the reorientation is there is a lot of money now going into defense procurement. Uh, there is uh, a lot of effort going into, of course, supporting uh, the, uh, the, um, uh, the Ukrainian uh, government uh, in its war against Russia and so forth. So this is, uh, you know, the meaning of this is simply um, a reconfirmation of uh, the skepticism that already during the Angela Merkel years was clearly visible um, uh, with reference to Macron's strategic uh, uh, autonomy at the expense of NATO. This is clearly not Germany's position and this has become underlined twice, three times by Scholz uh, with his Zeitenwende statement and more important than statement of course, the actions taken in the aftermath of that statement. Yep. Thank you. I do have one additional question, but if anyone has would like to go next, I'll defer. Nobody objects, so please go ahead, Mackenzie. Sure, so um, I'd like to ask about um, the situation between Turkey and Greece, because that's, another item on the agenda. Um, and I know that they're obviously both NATO members, um, which I suppose complicates the tensions. Um, in, in what way could NATO be used as a mechanism to 
help relieve that tension. And it, I wonder, I wonder if their membership has aggravated it. I know it's it's historical enmity and the recent tensions um, have not come to a head like a to mm -hmm. the point that we've seen in the past fifty years or so, like three times nearly coming to war. But um, I wonder if if that's mm -hmm. on the horizon. Mm -hmm. I didn't quite get the question, uh, maybe also for technical reasons, I'm sorry, but you are asking for uh, what, what are the implications of this, this new conflict about resources between Turkey and Greece on, yes, please, yeah. on, on this uh, relationship of NATO and the EU, right? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, in a way, but otherwise, please uh, correct me or just uh, come up with your next question. Uh, so this is, of course, a very a decisive uh, kind of area down there where Turkey is located, where Greece is located, uh, because uh, this is, you know, bordering areas where, uh, where we have a lot of, uh, um, uh, what is it, frozen conflicts or even open conflict. And uh, both countries are so close, Mediterranean countries so close to the Middle East, uh, that it's really the southeastern flank, the NATO people would say, where a lot of security challenges uh, are awaiting for NATO and the EU countries. And uh, you were right, of course, to point to the difference. Uh, Greece is a member, has been a member for long in, of NATO and the EU, why uh, Turkey has only been a member of uh, NATO from the very beginning in a way, or since 52, a little bit later, uh, joined NATO. And uh, so, however, they have been a candidate state to become a member uh, of the European Union already since the 1960s. However, you know, the decisive kind of change of the situation is coming about now, not from the international scenery, but I would argue from inside Turkey, uh, that in my evaluation, the changes in the Turkish society, mainly or most visibly during the uh, previous uh, uh, time of Erdogan's rule, uh, who really turned the state into a, a very self-assertive a country of a, uh, one, uh, which wants to become a regional power. However, you know, uh, based on norms and based on values which are actually not in line with what we call the set of Western norms and values. Freedom of the press, uh, freedom of religion and uh, separation from politics, which was such a strong element in the traditional Turkish uh, scenery against the Ataturk kind of uh, revolution and so forth. But all this has changed under Erdogan and uh, the democracy uh, issue and so forth. Uh, so this has led from my perspective to a deadlock in negotiations uh, between the EU and NATO about a membership. You know, so on the one hand, uh, there is still there are a lot of words. We are both committed to continue this, but de facto, they are stalled the negotiations. De facto, they are stalled. And uh, this is, of course, uh, important to know. However, this does not have a direct impact, you might say, unfortunately or fortunately, on the uh, energy issues and the resource issues, which are on the agenda of the conflict between Greece and Turkey right now. This is about not about values. This is about manifest vested interests in terms of resources, energy resources. Yeah. So, and uh, in the world, Germany knows what it is, uh, energy crisis. Western Europe knows what it is, an energy crisis. And so do Greece and Turkey. Therefore, they have a manifest interest in claiming uh, the uh, resources uh, down there in the Mediterranean. And this is what they are competing for. And the issue is, you know, how to negotiate, hopefully negotiate between NATO members. Yeah, negotiations should be, yeah, uh, yeah, that should be going without saying, you know, this should be the normal mode in a security community to actually reach a cooperative agreement on how to do justice to both sides' legitimate interest in getting hold of some of the secure of the uh, energy resources they are after. 
there. Yeah? So it is important to reframe this whole competition into a cooperative game in order to allow both parties to see that they can both win from striking an agreement. But we are not there. And it rather uh, looks as if it's going to uh, escalate in the next months uh, than, it's, uh, look, uh, than it is uh, looking like a, a cooperative kind of uh, endeavor and, and, and the resolution of the manifest conflict of interest, as I called it. Thank you. Okay. This is, of course, also a very traditional conflict, you know, long standing decades and maybe even uh, centuries, uh, the roots of the Turkish Greek uh, conflicts. You know, this is, you can write books about it. You have to read books, tons of books on this. So it's a very specific part of the NATO story and the EU story, you might say. Okay, other question. Please feel free, whatever comes to your mind, I'll try to find an answer. So if I realized it correctly. I took note that some of you represent Sweden, Romania, France, Denmark, and Bulgaria, right? Or did I miss anybody, any, any country? No, this is it, yeah. So this from my side is very important to see that you have Romania and Bulgaria as so rather younger member states of both organizations. You have France as one of the very founding members of both organizations. You have uh, Sweden uh, aspiring now to become a member to NATO and only a few years back joining, uh, they joined the European Union. And we have now Denmark as a very special state in the security field uh, for years uh, since Denmark opted out of the common defense and security policy of the European Union. However, opted out for years, they were saying, not our business, we are constructively abstaining, you can do what you want, but we don't join the EU member states, our partners inside the European Union, strengthening common foreign security policy, but we'll stick to our NATO commitment 100%, full stop. This has changed now also with the Ukrainian crisis and uh, Denmark has uh, given up on its opt out and in a way, opted in. So I hope that uh, the one uh, who was it who was representing uh, Denmark has come across this already. Probably you have, haven't you? Anything else regarding countries' position, countries' interests? Hello, uh, I have yes, a question. Vicky? Yes. So for Sweden, I've been working a lot on enhancing regional security. I was wondering, what do you think widespread across the EU and Europe? What might be the largest security threat right now, aside from um, Russia's possible aggression? Uh, well, yeah, it's OK. Um, first of all, you know, you have to see that uh, the threat is only coming from countries who want to undo the security order that had been established during the previous uh, 20, 30, 40 years, based on the Helsinki Accords and so forth. Uh, so, however, Talking about this, this, you know, the only revisionist state I can see for the time being, please help me out, but is Russia, unfortunately. They were part of the club, but they said, no, we do away with it. It's no longer in our interest. And now with the fighting against or fighting the war against Ukraine, they have made clear that they have another, a different agenda than the rest of Europe. You know, the baseline that Olaf Scholz also in his Zeitenwende speech underlined twice and three and four times is, you know, that the 
security order manifest in the OSCE uh, uh, Charter, Charter of Paris was you can talk about everything. You can even change borders, but you can change borders only peacefully and by agreement and not by war. Yeah, that was the baseline. And this has been changed by not just the threat, but by the aggression of Russia in the Ukrainian situation. So again, if we now take the Turkish-Greek uh, conflict into consideration, this is not so much about, uh, in the first place, at, lo at least not about uh, challenging the existing borders between countries, other than the actual uh, line, the border line between both as far as they cover or don't cover um, uh, uh, undersea kind of energy resources. You know, this is really a qualitative difference. However, it comes with a manifest threat also that both might lose control of the situation and maybe in a situation where they not sure what the other side will do might escalate into military conflict. We don't know and everybody tries and works hard to talk to both sides inside NATO or from the EU with uh, Turkey as well uh, to get away from this uh, danger of escalation. Yeah, but I don't see aggressors like uh, currently, unfortunately, Russians are uh, other uh, in, in the whole area or the other neighborhood. You know, there's no Egypt, no Morocco, no, I don't know what uh, country actually eager uh, to uh, to attack uh, any of its neighbors, which could be, you know, a neighbor of the European Union or NATO countries right now. But maybe you would like to challenge this statement. Thank you for your thoughtful comments. I appreciate your input. Welcome. Ernesto, is there anything you wanted to add? Um, oh, I, I mean, I, first I want to just say thank you. I think that uh, uh, your presentation, Doctor, was very, very clear, very interesting. Um, uh, I also agree that Russia is like the most important situation. I, I can see a, a, a question from Jose, so I, I will try to be brief. Um, the, even when there are some other countries that might be challenging. I mean, not for, not for Sweden, but speaking about the European Union, I think the situation of Turkey is always challenging and um, demanding because it's it's like uh, always say in in a gray area, no, uh, and there are a lot of conflict of interests, many things that the European Union would like to criticize or just to highlight, but at the same time is this refugee situation there uh, that, that has, I mean, uh, the European Union has benefited a lot, a lot from, from Turkey. Mm -hmm. So this is something that I, I would add, but I completely agree with, with Dr. Peter's perspective. And thank you very much for, for your presentation. My pleasure. Jose had another question you said? Yeah, um, so I was wondering uh, if the European Union had like any measures or taken any action for the event that uh, Russia kind of like balkanized, not balkanizes, but like there's a power vacuum and, you know, kind of uh, mm -hmm. causes a refugee crisis of sorts, mm -hmm. maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, interestingly enough, you mentioned this uh, old concept of balkanization, you know, and uh, of course we have to realize that uh, Russia has been challenging the security order, not just uh, by attacking uh, uh, the, the Ukraine, uh, but they also uh, challenged uh, the, uh, the uh, integration of uh, some of the Balkan states into the EU and into NATO. 
Yeah, so and their stronghold, their major ally, was for a long time. Guess who? Hundred points for who? Yeah, well, their partner was Serbia first of all. Yeah, the traditional kind of link again, very historic links between Moscow and Serbia. However, also this has changed. You know, uh, only recently you could realize uh, still. The Russians tried to have uh, their finger in the pie there in the Balkans and to steer up conflicts and not to allow uh, these states to come closer, to move closer, to in be integrated into the EU or even into NATO. Uh, but, you know, the Serbian government, the old friend of the Russians, has also now drawn its feet in a way. Uh, and uh, therefore, the Russians, with their activities in Ukraine, also are losing grounds in the Balkans, I would claim. And I could even extend this and say there's an alternative to NATO in the eastern part of Europe, you know, which is the, um, which is the Collective Security Treaty Organization, CSTO, headed by, the, uh, by Russia, but uh, six more members. Uh, all previous uh, uh, previous uh, uh, parts of the Soviet Union, now formally at least and legally uh, independent states, but partners in this CSTO uh, uh, alliance, military alliance. And the most interesting thing is that those states also don't sign up for what Russia has been doing in the Ukraine. Yeah, so they also, although they are supposed to be weak partners of a strong partner of a dominant Russian partner, and they are usually uh, expected to follow suit what the leading partner is uh, telling them to do. But Kazakhstan is a good example, you know, and the other states, uh, they have not signed up or uh, confirmed the annexation of Crimea or the annexation of, what is it, Luhansk and uh, the other part, what is it again, uh, Luhansk and, um, help me, Donetsk, yeah? Uh, so uh, the Russians wanted to get support, not just from China, but from wherever they can get it, maybe from India and South Africa, and I don't know what, but they don't get it from their closest partners in the alliance, yeah? So you can see the Russians, uh, or the partners of the Russians are breaking out. They are, uh, how do you say, defecting from that alliance to some degree. Yeah. So this is uh, all in, uh, if you like to uh, call it a zero sum game, all in our favor, you could say, since it's uh, directed against uh, Russia winning the war. Yeah. So this is also interesting. And look at the Chinese and their reservations about the Ukrainian campaign uh, by the Russians. Yeah. So, Jose, still on? No. So, what else? Maybe just as a member of a university, of a European university, and of uh, the Transatlantic Masters program here in, uh, in Chapel Hill, I was present at the creation of this program when we uh, signed up for the consortium agreement in 96, starting negotiations here in Chapel Hill. So I've always been a partner of this program. Uh, and you know, we have to see as universities, at least in the European context, uh, the 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 uh, new policy by Germany's government, but also by the other European governments, to strengthen its spending on defense, will probably lead to domestic conflicts about the redistribution of funding. You know, since after all, uh, you know we can spend our money only once, and if it's spent on universities, you can't spend it. On defense. If you spend it on defense, you can't spend it on 
universities or on healthcare systems or whatsoever, which is not just uh, popular or to some degree, but not the same degree as in Europe, uh, you know, but uh, all these kind of trade-offs that you can sp spend money only once are increasingly, of course, conflicting now also in European societies in uh, given uh, the challenge and giving, uh, given the new priority or strong uh, um, commitment to strengthen the common uh, defense uh, capacities here. Yeah, so we simply have to see there are a lot of domestic issues involved uh, if you come up with a decision to spend more on defense. It's not just that, you know, it's more than that. It's also about setting priorities uh, from the different governments. What is your priority? Priority. What does your electorate expect from you? Uh, do you want to win the next elections? Do you win it with a strong defense budget or with a strong health budget or a strong educational budget? Yeah. So there are a lot of domestic issues involved. Okay. Does anyone else have any more questions? Ernesto, any closing thoughts? Or Dr. Peters, any last closing thoughts? Well, I mean, uh, no substantial uh, statements, but uh, I'm strongly encouraging you to take this kind of simulation, you know, very uh, seriously. Uh, I think it's a, it's a good uh, kind of form of familiarizing yourself with the normal procedures of diplomacy in a way. And, you know, as long as we uh, are in the world of diplomacy, we are in the world of cooperation, you know, and this is uh, what has to, uh, what we have to make sure uh, that uh, whatever happens, that we continue talking about our issues. So please go ahead and do this uh, simulation and learn how to bring uh, or how to gain a common ground, even though uh, sometimes the interest or sometimes the preferences uh, are diverging, you know, by negotiations, you can reach compromises and we have to reach compromises. And this is the whole story underlying the European integration process. Unity, what is this uh, speak, Europe, European Union speak, unity and diversity. So uh, this kind of program or this kind of motto I like very much, but it depends on the willingness and the efforts, constant efforts of peaceful change by negotiations. Okay. Great. Thank you so much for your insight and uh, today. Great discussion. Thank you all for your great questions. My pleasure. Thank um, you. We are looking forward to participating in the Pittsburgh MEU uh, next week. So we'll see you all next weekend in Pittsburgh. Thank you. Good luck and bye bye. Thank you. All the best. Thank you, Kayla, Thank you, for everyone. organizing this, this meeting. Thank you very much.